Thanks, good morning. I hope you're ready to uh, learn a lot because I've prepared quite a lot. Um, also, I understand that some of you have tried to do some sort of database searching and it's more new to others. So uh, I'll try to, to go from the basics and then also cover some of the slightly more advanced, but I'll start with the basic and then we can essentially see how far, far we get uh, on this. So yes, I come from the University of Copenhagen uh, where we have a center which is called uh, Center for Protein Research and I'm in the proteomics unit there. Uh, in a group under Jesper Olsen where I've been for many years now. So I've been in the field of proteomics for more than 10 years now. So, Yes, so you've looked at yesterday, just to recap what happened yesterday. So yesterday you actually looked at some spectra and you tried to figure out what are these spectra and wh what peptides are they. So that's the, the very basic of shotgun proteomics. That is to find out what is the, 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 this bottom-up approach. So what is, is the spectra and what is the sequence that they really represent? So that's what we talk, uh, I'll talk more, more about, or that you'll learn more about uh, today. So was it fun? Did you have fun doing it? <laughs> I, I, at least for me, I think it's, it's a bit of a puzzle effort and it, it is a bit fun to do, but it also takes a long time, right? So well, I guess some of you managed two of them. Not everybody managed all three, right? <laughs> so, and you had more than an hour, well, maybe one. <laughs> Did any of you keep making the same mistakes or these kind of things or couldn't really figure out what it was? So there are some other motivations as well for, for trying to, to get a computer to do this. Because um, as you also know, then uh, we have a lot of genes, a lot of around 20,000. If we look at RNAs, we have maybe 100,000 different. So this is just a reminder. I guess you know this. But if you talk about proteoforms, that's kind of the new uh, word in, uh, when you describe a lot of different proteins in different states. And there, there may be a million if you include all the different modification states and splice isoforms and all these things. So this is the world that we're trying to describe with proteomics, right? That's a really, really complicated uh, setting. On the other side, we have uh, our instruments. So I just have three random instruments here. Uh, and many of them are actually capable of, of sequencing. So this is generating these spectra that you saw yesterday at very, very high speed. So if we just do the, this is just doing very basic math, 10 MSMS per second, that's more than 600 per minute. That's more than 36 hours per hour. So we are getting close to a million per day on these spectra and often, we actually split out, we fractionate our samples, so they run for may maybe a few hours or maybe a full day, maybe multiple days. So we can actually, just for one sample, we can have a lot of spectra. But this kind of fits that we're trying to go from describing all these proteins or proteoforms, uh, and well, we need computers now because there's no way that we can sit down and uh, do this manually. So essentially we want to get from, so that's what we'll talk about here, that's to go from these, a lot of spectra, to, to these peptides and it's essentially how do we, how do we go, uh, get there. So I'll just present what is our standardized workflow uh, for, for shotgun proteomics, that is when we take some, some proteins and now we do a digestion, so that's the discovery base. You could also do top down. Uh, but in this case, we, we, we digest things into peptides, then we separate them over time. This, is, this could take hours. Then we uh, analyze them on a mass spec. We get uh, full scans information, so that's the parent iron, so that's the intact peptide. And then we also get these fragmentation spectra that you looked at uh, previously. And then we have this computer thing here uh, and that should give some, some output. And you'll learn later, I think, on, on the actual output. But right now, we'll try to cover this part here. So, yeah, essentially getting from these parent ions to the fragment and then getting to the proteins. So, I have this, so right now it may be a bit of a black box. So we have a lot of spectra and we try to, to get some peptide and protein identifications. If you want to make an exhaustive list of what kind of tools are available for this, because this has been a challenge for quite some time, uh, so now I just went to msutils.org and then I read out, okay, what are kind of the current uh, method? There's a lot of software available. 
So it's also a bit difficult giving a, a, a lecture here on saying every software works this way or all, because they're all a bit different, right? So what I've tried to do here is to, to give you some of the general trends that is common to all these software uh, tools and maybe a bit more specific on some of the, 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 the issue or the, some of the things that I know because I don't know all of them. So what you'll use later, I think, is this, uh, is this, uh, what happened? Um, is this Max Quant software here? Uh, it's also here, Max Quant. Uh, that's from the Matthias Mann lab, uh, but then also some of the other, are you also going to do some mascot searches or no, not really, okay. So, but at least the Max Quant uh, you'll uh, learn about later. Uh, but in case you want to use another tool, I mean, all the vendors have their own, you can also buy a lot of them and yeah, there's a lot of tools available. But the basic principles are, uh, are somewhat the same. They may have a strong focus on one part or another, but this is, this is the different part. So the software questions. So this is actually a really important slide. So uh, you can mark that with a, with a star or something in your, in your notes. You need to know a bit about what type of fragment lines or the, the software may know this for you, but often you need to, to specify something on what type of fragment science are expected. So which fragmentation method was used? Was it collision induced? Then it's probably more I, Y ions and maybe also B ions. Uh, if it was uh, something with an electron transfer, then we may be more in C and Z ions. Also, and this also, uh, so, so what is the error on, on the, our masses? So we have a mass, then kind of what, what's the error on this mass? How can we know uh, this, how accurate this was measured? This also goes back to, to uh, which mass analyzer, which instrument you're using. You can very often just look this up. But it's something that, or you can look it up. It's not something that you need to know by heart. You just need to know which kind of instrument was used. And this, or ask someone, <laughs> and then they can tell you uh, what this was used. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay, then there's a bit of uh, sample related questions. Uh, so uh, for instance, which protein sequences do we expect to find? So this essentially, um, many uh, proteomic workflows use some sort of uh, gene predictions. Uh, so essentially a database of the proteins that are uh, in, 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 the, in this sample that we're working with. Yeah, you should of course remember that uh, you're also a human that handles the sample and often a part of you also ends up in the sample that's very hard to, to, uh, to, to separate, to, to keep completely clean. You may try, that's a good idea to try, but it's very hard because you're essentially a fountain of keratins that's just walking around and contaminating everything. Mm -hmm. So that means that maybe you should also add some human, at least some human, uh, uh, this is sometimes done automatically, but there is uh, added some keratins in your sample. If not, then you should maybe add it. Uh, you find a contaminate list. There are quite a few of these. What is kind of common to see could also be if you do cells, then you actually add serum. This comes from bovine serum often, right? So that means you actually need to add some bovine sequences to the database. So you have to think a bit about what could be in the sample. So then there's also, so in this uh, shotgun uh, approach, we also use, we use an enzyme to, to chop things up into peptides. Sometimes these enzymes are very specific. This is usually if you, trypsin, expensive trypsin, that's usually very specific. At least the vendors claim that uh, it is. But you can also buy trypsin that's uh, a bit cheaper. And what's the difference then between this cheap trypsin and the more expensive trypsin? And this is often goes to how, how specific so this is actually cleave. You can also use other enzymes than trypsin. But then it starts to be that these enzymes may or may not be specific. Depends a bit on which particular ones you get. So that's also a bit, uh, that's a bit of question. So we'll get back to this on, on, the, on, on the enzyme specificity. And also uh, something to keep in mind is that you actually have the sample and you move it through some biochemical workflow, right? And this, this workflow, you may heat it, you may uh, apply some voltage if you're running over a gel, and there's a lot of modifications that you may actually introduce. So this is also some, so oxidation is a typical of methionines, this is a typical one we see, which is coming from the, just handling the sample or the actual uh, electrospray process on the, just before the mass spec. So there's quite some things that you can actually introduce on the way, and you don't want to mistake those from something biological important. So, yeah. So this is just some very basic questions <laughs> on uh, what 
software th settings actually, how, how do they affect the, the sample and, and the instrument? And you should maybe think a bit, about, have these in the back of your mind. So keep this slide, but uh, it's good to come back to this once you, because you tend to forget these things. So let's get back to the black box and try to make it a bit more uh, visible or, or, or on what happens. I like to talk about these things in three steps because I think it makes it a bit easier to understand. And that's also, all software tools do this, these three steps in some way or another. So one I call the extraction features, uh, extract features step. It may sound a bit strange, I'll get back. It's very simple actually. Then there's the actual database search, that's a bit more complicated. And then maybe the most complicated step is, is how the last filtering is done. So, okay, seems like everybody are following me so far, so that's good. So let's, let's look at the, this extraction step. So now we want to extract features. That's what I uh, term it anyway. So essentially, this is two things. It's finding the precursor information. So this is what is the mass of the intact peptide and what is the charge? And what, is, uh, what are all the, the fragments that these generate? That's the mass, charge, and intensity. So you did this yesterday. And you actually may not have even have thought about that you did it. But you can look at, at, a, at a full scan, and then what you essentially have is you have the monoisotopic precursor here. You have a few, this is probably another peptide. And then you have the, the isotope envelope, uh, envelope here. Do you know what this is? Okay, that's good. So this is the number of, of naturally occurring carbons that actually makes that this whole envelope is actually one peptide. I hope you all know this. And then we can deduce the charge based on, on, on this. Then we look at the fragment scan. So the computer actually goes in and, and says, okay, these are, the, these are not really the ones, that, these are not the masses that we're looking for. We're looking for the monoisotopic precursor mass and we can find the, the charge here as well, right? That's what the computer reads out from this first step. I've been keeping it very basic. It will get more advanced later. Uh, so here we have the, the fragment scan and essentially it does the same for all the fragments. And, and this just means it finds out all the, the, the masses that are, that, are, uh, that are in the fragment scans. And then it associates the monoisotopic precursor with this fragment scan. So sometimes the, the, it was actually uh, not the monoisotopic precursor that was fragmented. Some, sometimes it was something else that was fragmented. So it may be a bit of actually trying to, to get these matched up. It's a bit, uh, it takes a bit of computing uh, power. So next, so now, now uh, so that was actually it for the, for the f feature extraction. So that was just reading the data. That's a reading step. So now we start to, to do what you did uh, yesterday afternoon. That is to try to find explanations for this. So that's what we usually refer to as the searching step. What you did yesterday was you came with no knowledge and you looked at this spectrum. You didn't know which organism it came from. You didn't know any of, you just looked for amino acid. Uh, how, where are they, where do they fit and what is kind of the pattern. That is usually the most hardest, the hardest part to do at all because you don't use any other information available. So that we call de novo sequencing. You don't do, you don't use any background. So yeah, that's what you tried yesterday. Database searching is a bit different because here we use a database. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what does it mean? So here we have a, here we have a, a protein sequence. And uh, does this make sense to you? I hope you can read one letter amino acids. So here we have a, a G protein coupled receptor family C group 5 member C uh, or GPC 5C human. And for instance, if we were using trypsin on this, then how would it look? Well, trypsin cleaves after arginines and lysines. Arginines and lysines. So here I've tried to mark, okay, where, do, where are the arginines and lysines in this sequence? <laughs> and essentially what it does is it does a cleavage, and this is called uh, an in silico, in silico digest, meaning computer-based uh, digest. And it's, it's actually very simple because you just put an enter after each sequence, and then it looks like this. And now you can actually have all the different so these are, the, these are the triptych peptides of this uh, particular. So going back, you have this. That's the full protein sequence. Now we have all the triptych digests. 
Does that make sense? Yes, good. So based on this, you can start to say, okay, now I want to calculate all the, all the masses, all the fragments, and this computer actually does. It, it finds all the theoretical uh, precursor masses, so the intact mass, and, and what are all the possible y ions and b ions if, that's, if it's collision-based in uh, dissociation. But you can start to, to do all these uh, calculations. Okay, now you start to maybe sense that, okay, we had all the theoretical or the experimental data, and we've read that. Now we have all the, the now we start to have all the theoretical data, and then it's a simple, uh, yeah. So here we have the theoretical masses and fragments. <coughs> now it's a simple matter of matching the experimental data with the theoretical data. That's what we call the search. So that's essentially going through all the combinatorics. So in this case, we could say, okay, we have a, a precursor that which generates some fragments. And then we have some database sequence, which may generate a lot of uh, theoretical fragments. And then we see, okay, when do we have a uh, when do we have a match in this? So we we go through and say, okay, when does the the theoretical actually match the the the, the experimental? And then we uh, find peaks in common, and assign a score. And I'll come back to the score because that's quite important uh, part of this. So for, for it tries to do this in, for all the, uh, the precursors that kind of fit with all the, the so, so with, with all these precursors which fit all the precursors, theoretical precursors or experimental with theoretical and tries to do this. Uh, uh, that's a lot of matching. That's also why this usually takes some time to do. It's a lot of spectra that needs to be matched with a lot of theoretical spectra. So the score. Let's, let's talk a bit about that. In general, it's a confidence measure of the assignment being true. Sometimes you can uh, find a p-value instead, but the score is more or less the same as a significance value. So, and usually it is a high score is a good match. So a very, I've, there's a lot of different ways of calculating such score, and I'll just show you some of them. Uh, and I'll start out with the simplest, at least in my view, the simplest. So here we have, uh, we found out, okay, this peptide actually matches with this spectrum because we can find some, there's a couple of matching fragments. You can see we have some Y ions and some B ions. And the percentage it says above here is the intensity percentage of the total value. So that's kind of, uh, so you have the intensity on this scale, right? So here we have, this, is, this peak here is, is equal to 7.7% .7 of the total this is 10.4, uh, et cetera. So the way to calculate the score here, this is called Morpheus. Uh, but I mean, that's just a name that someone has come up with. It's a bit, yeah, it's just, so here they just count the number of ions that, so if they have, in this case, they have 10, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, so the score is 10. And then they add, uh, so then they sum also the, the percentages, and then they come up with 30.2. Well, this means, that, so this is percent, right? So you have to, that's 0 0.302. And then if you add these two together, then you end up with a, a score of 10.3. So it's super simple. <laughs> this score is the most simple one. It can also get, uh, get more advanced. So this is the, the max quant score on how that's calculated. Um, it takes, again, experimental data, theoretical data, and then it does all the matching with some tolerance based on the instrument. And then here it's, um, and this may look, look a bit, uh, oh, what's this? So this is essentially um, a, a binomial distribution, a summed binomial distribution. And this is based on uh, the number of, uh, of um, matching hits compared to the number of theoretical hits. Does that make sense? So it's kind of, uh, you, you're trying to say, okay, if we get three out of 10, that's maybe not so, oh, maybe it's okay. But if it were three out of 100, then it was probably worse. If, if it was 10 out of 10, then it was really a good match, right? 10 out of 100, that's a bit worse. So, so it depends a bit on how long is the sequence, how many fragments can you actually generate versus how many do you actually match up. So that's how this is calculated. And here you have the math of, of it actually uh, doing this. Um, and actually, this one is, is then also done in a, in a, 
so, so uh, it, it includes also if there can be losses on fragments. So, so fragments can sometimes lose water, and then oh, things get a bit more complicated. So you can actually have wires which start to lose water as well. And then but this, this tends to get really important when you st uh, start to talk about PTMs. So I guess you'll hear about uh, that a bit later on uh, when you see these losses. Uh, then it starts to be a bit complicated and you start to be really happy that you have a computer doing all this because then you don't need to worry too much on it. So there's a bit of optimization here and there's also another optimization and this is essentially a noise filter because you always have that, you could probably also see that yesterday, that you had some peaks in your spectrum that you don't really know what that is. And that, well, we broadly define it as noise when we don't know what it is. So sometimes it may actually be interesting stuff in this noise. but. We, so here there's, a, there's a, a commonly applied filter, which is uh, dividing the whole fragment spectrum into 100 AMU settings. So you just kind of uh, divide it into 100 bins, and then you take some sort of uh, top 10 within uh, this region. And then you start to lose the, 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 the lower, less abundant. That's a very pragmatic uh, approach and not very statistical based, I guess. But it seems to work quite nicely so far. And uh, there's a lot of, this is still a young field. There's a lot that could probably be improved in, uh, in these kind of uh, noise optimization. This is just to show that, that there can be more advanced stuff than just matching and counting. Uh, so, so this is, is one way. Here's another way uh, of, of doing it. So again, you have the theoretical or the, uh, the experimental. So you have some acquired uh, spectrum. And then you have a, a sequence database, you generate these theoretical spectra, and then you do the comparisons. So what comes out of this is actually a, a, a long list of possible assignments. And for each of these, you can calculate a score. So you can imagine that based on one fragment spectrum, like one of those you had yesterday, you can actually make a lot of different assignments. Some of them will, will be really poor because they may only match one fragment. But there will be, this relates to also that some amino acids actually weigh close to the same if you put them in combinations because there's only so many different things. So, so this means that you can actually make kind of a distribution plot of this and then you can look at, okay, what's the best one? Then, so here we have the score and this is a histogram essentially of all, the, of all the possible assignments. And then you can start to look at, okay, this one, how far out is it compared to the background? So in other words, if this was random, then how far out are we here? And then we can kind of calculate another value. So now we're not, now we're moving away from scores into expectation values. So this is essentially how far is this from the background distribution? That's another way to, to calculate another measure where you take into account, okay, there can actually be some random, you, you, uh, you, you collect some information on the randomness of these random hits here because these can also explain this uh, spectrum. It's just that this peptide is actually the one that does it the best. But how much better, better is it than some of the others? Well, you can try to make some kind of histogram plot and that now we've moved to expectation values. Did I lose all of you in that or you're still following? Yeah, some not. Yes? No, I don't think there is a, there is a problem in the internal lucidity of the, between the cycles. So you, can consider, you should consider the top score for 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 the most matching cycle, mm -hmm. or you do like an average of the cycle of the score. So for this, it actually works in the individual peptide. So it's it's just one spectrum, and then you're looking at that. But uh, I'll come. I'll get back to when you look at multiple because that's exactly what we have here. So maybe I can just wait a few slides and then uh, come back to your questions. This is quite important because we tend to import, we tend to forget this that every spectrum essentially get a sequence match. And if you look at this, it's actually wrong. Every spectrum gets many sequence matches. We can, so this is what the basic searching it does. It just provides a lot of candidates for each spectrum. It doesn't tell you anything about, well, it gives you some score or some confidence of how the assignment was, but it doesn't tell you how good that was or, or can we actually trust this. And that's a bit of a problem in this that, okay, we can actually assign to a lot of things. We can explain 100% of the data if we uh, just don't use any cutoffs. We can actually explain every spectrum with a lot of peptides and say they're all there. Well, maybe not. Uh, there's probably some things that are just kind of, we just try to match everything. So that's, that's 
that's what I want to talk about, about now. So this is essentially the search. So the output of the search is often just a long list of, of assignments. And it's, it's uh, scored in a way, but it's not, it's not filtered down to where you know which confidence you have. And that's the kind of next step I want to talk about. That's the, the, when can we actually be certain about and how do we control errors in this? How do we know and when can we actually call something for identified? When, when is this called identified in a, seen from a proteomic standpoint? So essentially, when is the hit correct? Does that make sense? <coughs> You're all with me so far? Yes. Good. So this moves to the last section here, which is called the filter step. So this is essentially trying to set a line somewhere that says, OK, these we call identified. These we, we don't trust because they're probably just random noise assignments. We ca these can't all be true, for instance. So um, just coming to the expectation value, so this is kind of a definition of, uh, of the expectation value. So this comes back to, to the, the slide I had two slides ago, this slide here. So this is essentially how far is this hit from the rest of the background distribution seen from a single uh, spectrum. So. The expectation value is the expected number of peptides with scores equal to or better than the observed best match scores under the assumption that peptides are matching the acquired MSMS spectrum by random chance. So the expected number of peptides. So this is essentially, if you look at this whole distribution, you can model this and say, okay, if this was just someone rolling a dice and then ending up with a score, <laughs> then that would probably, you get a distribution uh, that would follow the kind of background distribution. So how random, how, what is the chance how often does it happen that we actually get a score that is equal to the best spectrum? That's ex essentially the, the, the expectation value. So this is seen from an individual spectrum. And that's the, in my view, so some people use this. But you should know that there's a uh, kind of a danger here. You can use it for single spectra. However, when you want to use it for a lot of spectra, you essentially do multiple hypothesis testing. And if you know the, the problem with multiple hypothesis testing is that, let's say we have a score or a significance threshold 0 .00, 0 0.05, that's quite commonly accepted, that's kind of the, the significance threshold, right? This means that if you do 20 tests, then you'll get one positive. That's exactly what this means. And the, and the problem that when you start to use this, then you often run into this problem that you do multiple hypothesis testing. So that if you, it's also because the expectation value is actually a bit difficult to calculate precisely. So, yeah, there's still some argumentation. Some, some say that this should be used, and, but yeah, not too many. Yeah, there's actually, a, a, so the golden standard is something else, and that's what I want to, to talk about now. That's what most people use. So that's what I call the standard, the gold standard, uh, FDR. So th this means the false discovery rate. So this is the, the we're, we're trying to control how many false positives to get. <coughs> so for this, we do a, a simple trick uh, when we create the database. So we have some database origin from human or somewhere else. And then what we do is that we t for each peptide, which you saw uh, me doing this before, that I just marked the arginines and lysines. Here they've done the same. They've also marked the arginines and lysines. But what they do then is what they, they do is uh, we, do, we do a kind of pseudo reversal. So we reverse the peptide sequence. You can see the, the A, C, D, E, F, G, H kind of comes in the other uh, direction here. Can you see that? However, we keep the, the lysine. There's a, uh, there's a reason for this because this, uh, this um, the problem is if we also swap the arginine and lysine, then the peptide mass changes. But in this way, we actually keep the peptide mass intact. Does that make sense? You can try it. This peptide here weighs exactly the same as this peptide here. Mm -hmm. If we had also swapped the arginine and lysine, it would not. OK? So that's why this small trick of keeping the, that's cool. It's, so that's, so yeah, so why do we do this? Because, I mean, otherwise it's just a bit of a bit stupid. So what you end up with is essentially two databases or a big database that's twice as big as normal. And this means, so we, we refer to these as uh, a forward or reverse database. So this is the reverse, this is the forward, and they're both part of this. 
And this means that when we uh, get this long list of, of peptide matches, we can essentially say that, okay, which ones are then originating from the, the reversed and which one are, we, uh, are originating from the forward. And if we do this across a large data set, then we can see that the chance of, of having a, um, a decoy for num in position number two is actually 50-50, roughly. So all these positions end up being roughly random if we do this. However, the first position have a bias for this one, for this database. Can anyone guess what the point of this exercise is? So what we've created here, do you understand this? Because, uh, so, okay, I'll try to explain it once more, maybe. Or I think I have another slide of it. Is this for, sorry, is this for normalizing the, the, the size of the pet? No, this is to uh, create, uh, um, essentially, uh, the, solving the problem that the expectation value is very nice to use for one spectrum. You want to have something that works for all spectra at once. So you don't do this multiple hypothesis testing where you test each spectrum individually. You want to have something that works on a population of spectra. I'll try to explain it here. I have another slide showing exactly the same thing. So we have some spectra. When we do the database search, we can say, okay, these spectra will be assigned. Let's only look at the top hit. So only uh, hit number one, essentially. And sometimes it will hit the, the target database, sometimes it will hit the decoy database. So sometimes it will, um, these spectra, it's, it's very simple, that may be why it's actually, uh, uh, I'll just come back to this. So the decoy database is constructed like this. So it's essentially the same uh, sequences that you have in the database, they're just reversed, almost, pseudo-reversed, but we call them reversed. But it's kind of a pseudo-reversal. So you have your normal protein entries. So for each protein, you essentially have a reversed. For each peptide sequence, you have a reversed. Does that make sense? So this means when you do all your assignments of comparing everything to everything, which is the search, then, let me just jump forward to this. Then what you get is, for some, you get a, a, a target assignment and for some, you get a decoy assignment. So you know this one came from the decoy database because you're, you're kind of keeping track on which protein, or you are keeping track of which proteins are reversed and non-reversed. So which peptide matches are then best explained by a peptide from the reversed side compared to the forward side. So this is it's a bit important to understand this because this is really a fundamental approach of how we control errors in shotgun proteomics. So if you have any Anyone have any questions, maybe? Then I can. Who understands this? I <laughs> understand <laughs> why, why the mass change when you uh, reverse the, the ends. So, because arginine does not weigh the same as lysine. So, here you have uh, the, 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 so the, the masses you have here yeah. are exactly the same, or the amino acids you have here exactly the same amino acids you have here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this means that you get, get the same distribution of masses in the forward and reverse sequence of peptide masses. You get exactly the same, almost. It's, yeah, actually you do. So that's, that's it's a quite clever trick. I can maybe also refer to a paper here. It's called the Target Decoy Search Strategy for Increased Confidence in Large-Scale Protein Identification by Mass Spectrometry in Nature Methods 2007, I think, yeah, March 2007. So that's a really important, they're not the first to describe this paper, but they, or the, this method, but they're one of the first that really show that it works. And the reason it works is that you, you can essentially say, okay, hit number two. So if you were to look at this list, right, mm -hmm. then you would say, okay, the first one is probably the right one, and the number two is probably the wrong one. That would, or that's what you would expect. Or actually, the rest of the list are probably wrong. You want to only explain, take the best explanation. That's how you normally try to explain spectra. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is that the first one is, tends to be more 
in the target database. So you know the target database is actually your, your species of interest. That are peptide sequences that are there. The decoy are not necessarily, or that you know they are not in your database or in your species, in your sample. They should not be there. So when you hit this decoy, hit, if, if this peptide was actually from a, a reversal, then you know, okay, this is probably garbage, this assignment. I don't trust this. So this is what you, you have in, uh, uh, down here. That if the, if you can essentially try to look at the positions and then down here it starts to be 50-50 if you hit the decoy or the, or, the, or the target. However, for the first position, you want to have the target, but sometimes you also hit the decoy because you can't, every spectrum will not necessarily explain, uh, you can't count on all spectra being called identified. Sometimes you will say, okay, couldn't really explain this. It's probably just noisy spectrum. Could be something else than a peptide. Uh, yeah, so, so, but you don't want to explain everything, but you want to kind of measure the error at which you want to. So this is the, the we want to be certain, and this is why they've come up with this. Okay, I think I've spent enough time on this, and uh, you can try and read more if you want to understand more detail. Um, or any questions I can try? So in this case, in the, in the first key, you have like a, 35% error that is uh, random. Yes, exactly. 35% of the spectra are assigned to the, to the decoy hit. So you can use this uh, because, of course, you don't want to accept 35% of your hits being, you know they're wrong, <laughs> then you'll not, you don't want to report them. But you can use this by essentially, so what you're looking at now is all, this, all, the, all the peptides that you have. And you look at uh, all the scores, so this is the best scoring peptide for each um, uh, for each fragment scan. So the, the, you've done this search where you assign everything to everything. Now you only look at the best one. And now you know if it came from, the, from this forward database or the reverse database. So you split your assignments based on this knowledge. If they hit the forward database or they hit the reverse. And then you look at how the, do the scores in general look. And then you get something that looks like this. So you get, uh, they call it, so it's essentially a histogram this. So it's kind of a, a smooth histograms of scores. So here you have the number of scans that are above the score threshold. Actually, it's, above, it's just assignments, essentially. So maybe I can explain it. Yeah, let's try it here again. So you have all your spectra. You assign them to the best. You're only interested in the best sequence assignment. Some hit the target. Some hit the decoy. In the case before, we had 35% hitting the decoy, the rest hit the target. Then you sort all of these, so you have a score for each, right? Then you sort all the best, so you get the best match for each spectrum, and you sort by score. So, and here you have all your spectral assignments. So you have a long list, and you sort by score. And then you have, uh, here it's called a label, you, have, you know if this came from the target database or the decoy database, meaning the, uh, so the forward or reverse database. Sorry if I'm using a bit of slang here. This, uh, this forward is target, reverse is decoy. It's called, it's, they're exactly the same. It's just two words for the same stuff. So in this case, we have the, the, the forward or target. For this one, it's scored 4.5. Here we have another. Uh, this, we probably believe these. Oh, we know this was, one is wrong. So this is a reverse hit. Okay, so now the, now the smart thing comes up because now you can actually just put a line somewhere and says, okay, I want to have a certain number of decoy hits, but not too many. And usually we say the decoy should not be more than 1%. So that's what they do down here. May, so they, they just count. So calculate the number of targets and the number of decoys. And this one is dying. But uh, yeah, so you have the number of uh, targets and the number of decoys. And then you, you, you set a line somewhere, and then you, you essentially just ca count the number of targets and the number of decoys. So in this case, you have three, three target and one decoy. So here you have the, so this would be, so the ST, that's the score threshold. So that's essentially those that are above the, the, the line uh, here. And then you can calculate what is the false discovery rate in this. So that's essentially the number of, um, that's the number of, of decoy hits over the number of target hits. So in this case, it would be one 
out of uh, so one decoy out of uh, three target. So that's one in three, so that's a 33% false discovery rate. Of course, normally we have a lot more spectra than, than four uh, assignments. So there we have, uh, and the, the general rule is that we apply a score threshold such that we have uh, one out of 100. So we have one decoy hit for every 100 uh, target hits. So that's then a, a false discovery. Uh, so then we control our uh, false discovery rate or FDR uh, at 1%. So that's how we usually keep track of, of errors so in these. So you do one of the Yes, so and normally you have thousands of, because we have millions of spectra, right? And that, this means you also have thousands of identifications. And then we accept that 1% is false. Okay. 1% of, of, of the, the true hits. Yes, so we remove that. So the decoys we know are wrong. So those we can accept. We, the only thing we use them for is to estimate how many among the target hits are actually wrong. Because we, uh, we know that there's a random chance effect here uh, that, that we can just match by random. I mean, you can assign everything. That's what the computer does. It finds the best explanation. The problem is it's too good. It finds explanations for something which is just garbage, <laughs> essentially. It's just, you, can, you can give it just uh, some, some random... Uh, noise spectra, and it can find, ah, this is probably this sequence, right? It can always come up with an explanation for these things. That's what the search does. It's very good at finding uh, candidates. Uh, that's what you want to use. The problem is you also want to control the error here, and that's actually the tricky part. And this is how it's done. This is how the error is controlled. This is this. So it can also not care about this, just accept that 1% of the hits that I, uh, that I put out from these algorithms are wrong. And that you should know. That you cannot trust everything in the list, you can trust 99% of it. Okay. So just, yeah? Sorry, because you know if I understood one. So the limit, the cutoff that you establish, like in your score list, yes. it depends actually on the quality of your spectrum because the, the uh, 1% exactly. will be higher or lower. Yeah. Exactly. So if you have really good spectra, you'll probably have a lot of hits to the target. If you set up the instrument or someone uh, screwed up the instrument before you ran on it, uh, then uh, and nothing is essentially or just random noise comes up in the, in the, in the, in the decoy. I mean, I've also tried when a, a colleague of mine borrowed a buffer and all of a sudden all my samples had yeast in them. And I was working with human samples. And uh, then I didn't really assign anything correctly because the peptide sequences were not, the database I was using was not the right one because it was a yeast sample, I just didn't know it. So, uh, so the, this then captured it and said, hey, there's something really wrong here, I can't assign my spectra. I think if you have a, like a small target that you have a small data set, you would check the spectrum manually, but with a large data set, you just don't have time to do it. So. Yes. I mean, the problem is you very quickly uh, get a lot of data, and then, uh, then, then uh, you can't, then you can maybe use the computer. To, so it's always good, and I've also do, been doing this. And on, if you whole experiment, you may generate millions of spectra, and you may assign a lot of them, thousands. But then you're, the, the call you want to make on your biological finding may boil down to a single spectrum. And then you can go back, and then it's very good to do the exercise you did yesterday on that particular finding. But then you probably don't want to spend all your time trying to figure, because you can't also, so the good thing is here, we can actually have some objective criteria for when is something identified, and not based on an individual sitting and trying to figure out how this probably fragments and what is probably true. So this is more objective than having an individual going through uh, all of them, and you can kind of control your errors in this way. And, um is your full discovery rate fixed no matter how big is your database? So it adapts automatically, right? That's the beauty of this, uh, that, that, it, that it adapts. So the, the target and the decoy database, they will, they will grow. But of course, the problem becomes, and I'll also get back to this if I have time, uh, uh, that uh, if your database is too big, then, then uh, it, the decoy will actually score very well because you have so many possibilities. This is, a, this is the more possibilities you offer, the, the better a match you can probably find. I mean, that's the basic. If you have a lot of, if you try a lot of times, then the chances are you probably can find a good score compared to if you only try a few times. So that's the, 
the, the thing about using a large database compared to using a more um, better database. I have a slide on this later. Um, okay. What you should know by now, if you forgot everything else, then is we have peptide sequences that are assigned to spectra in this workflow. And there's control of the FDR. So now we're essentially almost there, right? Because I haven't talked anything about proteins yet, and that's often what we're actually interested in. So we have sequences, and we have FDR in control. So that now there's a bit of proteins. So let's, let's look at a, an example here. We have, uh, in this case, 11 peptides identified. These peptides, and we call them identified with, with a 1% FDR, blah, blah, blah. Let's put that aside a bit. These are identified. We trust these identifications. Now, if we look in the database, what do they match up to? Well, they, in this case, we uh, can assign all these 11 peptides very nicely to this protein, which is alpha tubulin. So we have 11 peptides that all match this protein. So the, my question to you is now, can we be sure that we have this particular protein in our sample? We have quite good evidence, I agree with that. But can we be sure that we have this particular protein? Well, you would probably argue, yes, it's probably true that we have this. But there's actually uh, alpha tubulin is a family of uh, proteins, right? So, and you can see, okay, it could actually be that we have a combination of some other proteins in our sample, right? That's a bit of a, oops. We, have, we thought about that. <laughs> That's annoying. <laughs> Why is there so many copies of... Anyway, <laughs> that's how a sample often looks. And the way we get around with this is that uh, we, we don't really call them proteins. We call them protein groups. So we can say, okay, we may not have the... Well, we may prioritize this protein, but it's actually... It could be any of these. So we will organize this in a protein group and says, these we cannot really differentiate between, but they're, they're probably there, some of them. That's how we, you should interpret when you see these long protein lists from proteomic, coming out of shotgun proteomic studies, that there's actually each protein is actually a protein group. And sometimes you have this that combinatorics can actually make up for some. Sometimes it's not that important. Sometimes it's really important. It's a very important thing to, to know about this protein group feature. It's just, it's a, it's a shortcoming of shotgun proteomics. It may not matter if you have the, so these are mostly isoforms or splice variants, and it may not matter for your biological conclusion, but it may. Sometimes you have, so this is just something you should know. I also, I also have a reference down here in case you want to, to uh, have more on this. If you have hydrofoil that's shorter or longer, could you just use another enzyme to check if you have any other more specific Definitely, yes. If you can find some, uh, essentially get more peptides, that's the way to, to go. And, but sometimes you, you end up in situations where you c just can't differentiate uh, because the, the, if it, one is just a shorter version of another one, mm -hmm. then um, you can at least not exclude that the shorter one was there, right? You can't really do that from a... The percentage of fragments should be different. Maybe, yeah, sometimes you can use the quantitative information to try to differentiate. There's been efforts trying to, to do this, to where you use the quantitative information. You can probably ask a question on that later, on how to use quantitative information to differentiate between different isoforms. It's quite advanced, and it's not, uh, it's not something which is commonly done. Let's put it that way. It's a bit difficult, because there's a lot of noise in these data as well. Mm -hmm. They explained me how the software yeah. was working. And regarding that, they told me that the software, it was PLGS, I think. Mm -hmm. It was using the quantitative data, and he was making an, an exclusion list. Yeah. So he took the unique peptides per uh, isoform, and yes. he said, okay, this one is present, so all the peptides in the same protein, I count them inside this protein. Yeah. And that sounds very good and very advanced. <laughs> but it's not true for all software platforms that they can do this. Um, and how well it works, that's another question, right? Uh, so at least you should know that it, this is the problem it tries to solve. 
And sometimes it, it works, and sometimes it probably fails at this, because these things are a bit difficult sometimes. So, but this is the limitation of shotgun proteomics that we actually cut things into pieces and then we afterwards try to put it together. Um, this is a stupid question, but if, so if you have a gene sequence yes. and you blast it, it's oftentimes homologous in parts at least, but now we are middle of family. Is it possible that if you didn't have a perfect all everything mm -hmm. You're not even looking at a family, and it's similar to some other. True. It, it could, uh, so in this case, it's all alpha tubulins, right? But it could actually be that if you just have a very commonly conserved peptide that's present in 100 proteins or so, then uh, you can't really differentiate these. So th and then it's dangerous to just make a call uh, based on, uh, on, uh, on that. So you have to look at what other members are in the family, essentially, to see okay, how confident can I be that this is actually the... the, the so maybe for this, uh, for the biological context here, it would be enough to know that it's alpha tubulin. Uh, but it's, it's not enough maybe if you want to talk about different splice isoforms, but also if this was, let's say, different uh, olfactory receptors or something <laughs> like this, right? Uh, other, uh, more, uh, or some other receptor family which may uh, have a lot of shared peptides, then it may be important that you have uh, if, if you know that, okay, this, this can be this particular receptor only or this group <coughs> of receptors. But that's the downside of doing all this uh, cutting into pieces that we love to do in shotgun proteomics, bottom up. That's the downside of the technology, essentially, that you end up with this product problem. Okay, so um, I hope you got this because it gets a bit more complicated on the next slides. <laughs> so let's look at this. So here we have uh, nine different peptides, and we can see, okay, in this case, there's, we can explain them by these five proteins. So then, of course, when the report is coming out of, uh, of the software, then it's often that we have these protein groups, and in this case, the protein groups would look like this. So the, these two peptides only point to this protein. That's kind of simple. That's uh, the simplest case, I guess. Then you have these four, four peptides, they kind of in pairs, you can see that these two point to both proteins, and then you have these more unique peptides that point to, to this. However, these would then end up in this. So we guess that it's probably this one, but this one may also be there, right? So that's why we would organize this in a protein group. And down here, it's a bit, uh, okay, they, all the peptides, so that's, this is the case, or could be a case from before, this is probably two very related uh, <coughs> proteins, not necessarily, but it could be very related, uh, at least seen from the peptide level, that we've been able to find three peptides that both match to pro both proteins. So this, in the end, you'd end up with three protein groups here. Does that make sense? I see some knots. That's good. So let's try to make it a bit more difficult. So what happened here? I just removed one. I tried to, so this is my PowerPoint skills. Um, oops. Yeah, so I'm removing this link here, right? And then saying, okay, how does that affect things? So it, it primarily, it, um, yeah, it's primarily this region. So now we're looking at this case here. So these two are the same. And these three down here are also the same. However, for these now, all of a sudden, we have a peptide here which uniquely points in this. And then we have some that uniquely points on this. And then we have this, which could either be, be B, so number four here, could either be B or could be C. In this case, you'd get the proteins groups as this. So you get one, two, three, four protein groups out. So you see the difference? We went from three to four. So now the question becomes, so peptide four here, where does that belong? Where should we assign this? Does it belong to this one, or does it belong to this protein group? Any ideas what to do? What do we do with this peptide? Can we use it for anything? Should we just throw it away? That's one option, I guess. But in large data sets, you, you, tend, to have, you tend to get a lot of these. So maybe there's a lot of information in this that we want to use. So what principle could one apply? I would say. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's confirmed by the other two peptides. Yeah, so yeah, I think maybe you have more proof that you have that protein group there. Yeah. So that's actually called a principle, which is good. 
<laughs> in many regards, because it's, it's, it's essentially saying that uh, the simplest of several hypotheses is always the best. So it's the less assumptions you make about your data is better. In this context, we use it to do exactly as, as you suggest. There are more evidence for this one than this one up here. So this means that we can include this, maybe, but this is often a software setting, but we can include this in this group here, maybe. We can also exclude it, but often it's a good idea, and that's at least the default value in the software tool you use later today, that is to use this for quantitative information for this protein here. So these are referred to by a number of things, but often they are called racer peptides. So these are non-unique peptides which are assigned to the proteins with the highest number of unique peptides. It's a quite simple approach. You just need to know that this problem is there. And this is how it's usually solved. It's quite, yeah. So the evidence that this present, that of the presence of the protein group is coming from the unique peptides. However, you may add some of these racer peptides to the group that could be to increase quantitative aspect. You can also look at, hey, if this is really different than the rest, then maybe it's, it's really not belonging, but often it is actually. So this usually holds up. And this usually works good for these kind of global big analysis. Then these simple assumptions actually work very nicely. That's how, how it's, it's, it's being done. OK, let's talk about, come back to FDR problem again, or, or, or the, the error. Because uh, in this case, so now I have a slightly different way of, of uh, viewing it. But let's say we had a, a, an FDR on 20%. So this means that if we had identified 10 peptides, then two of them would be wrong. Often you would not use 20%, then you use 1%, but then I would have to have 100 peptides on my PowerPoint slide, and I can't have that right now. So now I'm just saying 20%. For, uh, yeah. So 20% on the, so PSM is short for peptide spectrum match. So this is essentially the link between a peptide and a spectrum. That's a kind of commonly <coughs> used peptide spectrum match. That's essentially the best match for a peptide. When you've talked about, you've made some cutoff and say, okay, this is actually uh, an identification. And now we do our protein grouping based on this. We know two of them are wrong. So uh, peptide two here and peptide eight. <coughs> And we can see we have, yeah, let's go to this. So the most abundant protein or the biggest protein in the sample could, would probably uh, generate, so if you think about it, if you have a protein in your sample, then you have some peptides. And in this case, after you've done the digestion, in this case, you want to go back and say, okay, we have evidence for, for like before, right? We have um, four, four peptides that point to this uh, protein. So that's quite good evidence, so to say. And for the, for the B, you have a bit less. And for the C, you may only have a single one. The problem here is that uh, the, the true hits tend to, to be true. And, <laughs> and they therefore also hit the, the, the same proteins. Because that's, while the noise hits, they just hit by random because that's, and we have just ensured that we have 1% or 20% in this case, uh, false hits. So this means that when we go from the peptide level to the protein level, then we also inflate our error because in this case, you can say, okay, we have these two peptides. They would probably be matching. So they are random, right? There's no reason to believe that they should actually match the same protein. I mean, they're just random matches. While the others, you actually expect them to match some of the same at least. So the problem is here, ooh, we may have be, now have moved from 20% here to 40% here. Is this a problem? And is everybody aware of this is a problem? So I think it's only now that's actually being discussed enough, this problem. <laughs> because there's been some very nice um, publications out. You may have heard uh, about some of them. So this uh, was the two proteum stories. I think you had a present these uh, papers presented. Um, so this, this was released in the uh, front page of Nature, two back-to-back -back papers in May last year. And what turned out here 
was that they had done these huge, huge efforts to, to measure a lot of, of uh, proteins. But if you look into the supplementary methods or supplementary uh, material, then you can find this plot. Where you can say, okay, this, these are the, so this is the target and the decoys, as I've explained to you. And this is now on the protein level. And this is the number of searches that they've been doing, right? So, so and each search here is, a, is actually one acquisition, which is several hours. So the, the data they present here is years of mass spec time, almost, at least, if you include everything. And the problem is that, that which they, has now also been, is really being discussed in the field, and there's been, uh, this is just one example, that the original authors actually come up with uh, an adjustment of the protein numbers that they published uh, in, the, in this paper. Because they hadn't really thought about this problem of that when you go from the peptide to the protein, you actually inflate your FDR, or they hadn't found a way to, to calculate this correctly. So now we actually add the forefront of what the scientific community is, is discussing. So we've gone some, from some very basic stuff to start with, and now we are kind of discussing some of the more advanced uh, stuff. So, so what they show here is that if we keep FDR constant, then they, in, if they just have a very few amount of searches, then they actually get close to 10,000 proteins. So what they reported was the human proteome, right? And for that, they probably needed to go to, to this kind of number up here. And you can see if they correct for FDR, then they're not nearly, they're kind of halfway there. And in proteomics, it's not just twice the amount of time, then you get twice the outcome. It's really, it takes a lot longer to get to, to these kind of numbers here. So what turns out is that there was probably not, the, well, it was a draft maybe, but it was not the, the full proteome that they uh, described in these papers because they had not really taken account for this FDR. And this is now being discussed a lot, that there was actually a lot of, you can see the, the difference. You can calculate the FDR here, right? Uh, so you have the number of targets, the number of decoys, and you can see that they're very, very high on the, on the false discovery. And this made it into nature. So actually two papers made it into nature. So uh, yeah, there's a bit of an issue uh, with this FDR. And uh, they think that this way, so they argue that, well, this shouldn't drop off like this. And therefore, the method that they've been using should not it's not the right one, then they come up with a new one. So this is actually published a few weeks ago, I think, or a month ago, uh, where they use a different method for, for establishing the protein FDR. So I'll not go into too many details on how different software tools are enhancing this FDR. It's very good if the software tool has some sort of protein FDR, which Max Quant does, and it's working quite nicely, I think. They didn't use that feature, but I think, in general, one should use some sort of protein FDR. It's good to do, because then you can be more sure about, you actually have control of your errors. You don't want to report just a lot of numbers. You want to report something which is actually there in the sample. And uh, yeah, you can, sometimes you can publish very high with high numbers. So I think I've been through this. How much time do I use? I use most of my time, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, questions on this? Something I didn't cover well enough? So, is the, uh, is that the general rule for every software? How they so the target decoy, the target decoy approach is now uh, the paper I showed, for instance, was 2007, right? So it's now a few years old. It's, it's very much tested. So on the peptide level, the, and this target decoy approach, it's been implemented in almost all software packages, I think. So the FDR on the peptide level is there. On the protein level, it's a slightly different story because it's it's not everybody who has been aware of it, obviously, uh, and it's now becoming. Proteomics is still young, still making mistakes. Uh, and the, the software tools, not all of them have a protein FDR, but you can try to pick a software tool that has it, and if not, then at least ask a question about, does this control protein FDR? Among these uh, so many different software, mm -hmm. is there the most uh, reliable one in publication? Or, I mean, when you publish something, does reviewer ask you to show the result from I think you can use, there's a lot you can use. I mean, uh, that, that you don't need to use all sorts of different software tools because they're fairly well established. As long as you, if you use your own in-house software tool, then you may uh, be, be asked to do some additional 
analysis using a, a commercially available or a freely available software package. But if you use one of them from the larger um, universities or more established ones, so those that you haven't produced your, uh, yourself essentially, then I think it's, it's uh, fairly well used. You can look at how many citations the, the papers that describe the different packages have and then see how widely used they are. I can say MaxQuant has more than 2,000, I think. It's quite high, anyhow, this MaxQuant paper. So, so it's, it's, uh, and it's, it's been developed for now, how many years? Since 2008, I think. So it's, it's uh, and there's a summer school each year for the MaxQuant summer school. So, so that's at least one option. This works for thermal instruments. Uh, recently also, so for all high resolution, it's being developed for all high resolution instruments. So uh, the newer, and it's trying to spread out. But there's also other software tools. Uh, like um, uh, PLGS, or, or, um, or that's for waters, or um, I mostly work with thermal instruments, and I'm, I'm a bit biased in that direction. Apologies to those. Uh